Good morning. All right, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1. And this morning, we're going to be moving along in our series um, entitled The Gospel, Know It, Live It, Share It. And for the next two days, we'll be kind of focusing on the living, the living part of it. So 2 Peter, chapter 1, starting in verse 3, going to verse 8. Let's read together. His divine power has granted to all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning um, excited for another day that you've given us um, and also excited to open up your word this morning to hear what you have to teach us, Lord. I pray that through um, your word to us that you teach us, convict us, challenge us, and encourage us this morning. In your name, amen. Okay. So in his second letter, Peter was writing to an unnamed church, most likely located in the region of Asia Minor also known as modern-day Turkey. Just like most churches throughout history, this church had a blend of Christians, seekers that were kind of searching for the truth, and skeptics who just wanted to kind of see what was happening from the background. And this church also had some false teachers that were twisting theology about God. We don't know the precise nature of the false teachers, but the fact that Peter is about to teach on the importance of relying on God's power for all things, we can make the assumption that they were both downplaying the power of God and man's responsibility in his sanctification. These false teachers were undermining the very basis of what it means to be a Christian, and it would be catastrophic if these believers, especially these early baby believers, would actually buy into some of these lies. So right now, you could say today the threats that following Christ don't look that much different in our culture than they did before, do they? 2019. We have people telling us that the power to change is all within you, or it's in our political system and someone who can save us, or in one of our latest discoveries or in our own talents. And within the realm of the church, there have been so many resources that become available to us with, with Amazon Prime and iTunes and being able to listen to any podcast at any point that we want to. And really, these aren't bad things. Um, There's really nothing wrong with a good podcast and good resources when they're gospel-based and we're able to sift through them um, with the lens of Scripture and be able to say, this is good material. Um, However, we also know that Christ followers in 2019 are surrounded by false teachers promoting a high view of man and a low view of God that is antithetical to the message of the gospel. So for this reason, if you want to live for the Lord, if you want to know him and live for him, save the time from reading the latest self-help book, or at least use the Bible as the standard to decide if it's true or not, and realize that the message of the gospel, particularly here in 2 Peter, is relevant for us in 2019, because God's power provides us with every resource that we need for spiritual maturity and effectiveness in the Christian life. So with that, let's dive in closer to the passage we just read. So if you're a note taker, the first point this morning is God provides the power we need for godly living. And that's verses three to four. God provides the power we need for godly living. I'll read that again. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his glory and excellence 
by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So here we have some overlap from yesterday. We talked about um, the knowing God. So we have fully God and fully man, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is using his divine power to accomplish his salvation by living, dying, and rising again so that we could be saved from our sinful condition. He had to enter our world to accomplish this because we were totally unable to do it on our own. So here's something simplified. If we were to break down the percentage of who did what, it would look like this. The God-man Jesus did 100% and sinful man trying to save himself did 0%. Jesus paid it all and that is the message of the gospel recapped right there. The gospel gives us everything that we need for a godly life because the gospel actually fuels godly living. I'll read that again. The gospel gives us all we need for a godly life because the gospel fuels godly living. So the term godliness literally comes from, means good worship. A godly life that is oriented towards God should naturally flow from a believer's life after they've come to know Jesus and the sanctifying and justifying and sanctifying work of what he did as, as presented in the Bible. So <clears throat> how do I access that power? That's going to kind of, we're going to get more into that with this passage, but I'm going to divert a moment from John, the Gospel of John chapter 15, verses 1 to 5. I love this passage. It's talking about the vine and the branches. Many of you may be familiar with this. This is what Jesus said in his teaching. I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. So this is an interesting place here. Jesus is saying, I'm the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. And in a moment, he's going to tell us that we're the branches. Here in this part of the parable, he's, kind of devi he's defining the roles of who does what. So first, we need to know here that Jesus is actually talking to his core people. He wasn't sharing the gospel with a group of unbelievers. He's talking to his people, particularly the disciples. In chapter 13, um, we see him preparing his disciples, getting ready for his departure. Um, in chapter 13, he acted as a servant and washed their feet. In chapter 14, he told them about the coming of the Holy Spirit, who was going to be with them to continue the work of the mission that he started. And now in chapter 15, he tells them that I am the true vine. So, if you remember, the I am statement connects with Moses' encounter, actually, with God in the Old Testament, where Moses says, well, what do I call you? Who are you? So I am. So here Jesus is connecting with the I am statement, saying that the I am God. I and the Father are working together in all of this. We're inter interlinked here. Jesus is God and is connected to the Father, and the branches are connected to the vine. If a branch doesn't bear fruit, the vine dresser takes it away. And if a branch does bear fruit, the vine dresser is going to prune it so that it bears more fruit. And so in our lives, we shouldn't be surprised when difficult times come into our life because as the God who works all things out for our good is actually using every situation that we ever encounter to do something bigger in our life, to prune us for the task that he has before us. Abide in me and I in you. And as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in me, neither can you unless you abide in me. So what does it mean to abide? What does it mean to abide? It's not really a term that we use that often. Um, I'm not sure how many of you after, I would answer that. To what? Obey. It's kind of, that, that could lead to that. I would say abiding leads to obeying. But that's, that's a good, that's the right direction. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Living together, right? Like being there. Yeah, that's, that's right. Kind of being with, and then obedience will come from that, the living part. But yeah, as we spend time with God and are living with him, we get to abide with him. So abiding is not really a word that we use very often. 
Um, that's why it's not the easiest word to define right away. But abiding isn't something we say to a friend, hey, do you want to abide maybe about three o'clock today at the library? It's not really the way we talk, right? Abiding. But it's the word that Jesus used that had a lot of deep meaning, telling us that unless we're going to spend time with him and be saturated in his truth and be with him, we will not be able to be fruitful believers. So it's a process for sure. It, this, uh, it's a process for sure, this whole abiding and this whole following. Um, but we'll never be perfect on this side of heaven. But we can confidently engage on a journey of godliness, knowing that God has given us everything we need to overcome sin and be effective for him. We'll never absolutely overcome sin on this side of heaven, but we do have the tools and the spiritual resources we need through the Father working through Jesus to do everything we need to accomplish the mission. Absolute dependence on Christ to accomplish it, because we have the gospel. So God's power provides us with every resource needed for spiritual effect effectiveness and maturity, and that leads me to the, my next point. Christ followers are called to actively pursue spiritual maturity. So, so far we've talked about what God has done through Jesus on behalf of us. That was basically what we spent all yesterday talking about, the gospel. Now we're moving on in verses 5 through 7, talking about us, believers, actively engaging in spiritual maturity. And this is where um, it really does get exciting. Verses 5 to 7 says this, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. So, as we see this, Peter starts the verse 5 with, for this very reason, he's referring back to verses 3 and 4, where we saw Peter lay the groundwork. But knowing that God has accomplished 100% of our salvation, Peter's going to bring up the main point, and it might even sound contradictory to what we just read, but Christians need to make every effort to live godly lives. After we've depended on Jesus 100% for our salvation, we are called to we are called to make every effort to live a godly life. When Peter writes, make every effort, he's letting us know that spiritual growth isn't an optional part of the Christian life. It's not just one thing to check off the list, um, but it's, it's the natural response to what God has already done through Jesus. So, Shehi students, faculty, staff, we've been saved, we've been redeemed, we've been set free, and we're new creatures, creatures, and that is a really big deal. We shouldn't stay the same after encountering, encountering God. It, it changes everything and reorients everything about who we are once we come to know the Lord, and that changes the way we live on a daily basis. So as we get back to our text, Peter describes the goal of reaching spiritual maturity as a series of ascending steps. I think I have a picture of ascending steps that might come next. Yes to give you a picture of that. Um, like the steps of a staircase, the eight virtues listed in this passage should be built upon as they journey towards, towards spiritual growth. And I love this metaphor that we have here. So not to be confused with a list of things, a checklist that needs to be completed in a specific order, um, but this list gives us qualities that will be desired and pursued along in our journey in the Christian life, always fueled by God's power in the gospel. That's the important part right there. Once we start doing these things and make it a, a man-made, I can do this, I can do that, look, how, look at the, the power I can muster from within, it's no longer the gospel fueling that. So the gospel fueling it is a, is a huge deal for this. Okay, let's first, let's go by one by one through these. First we have faith. Faith is the first godly characteristic upon which the other characteristics are built upon. It's the virtue that we use to respond to God's call in our life when he first called us. It's also what we, the, the thing that we use every day to continue to trust in the Lord and follow him every day of our lives. Our faith in God empowers us to put on all the godly characteristics that we see on this list, in the fruit of the Spirit, and in other lists that we see, especially in Paul's letters. Um, the fruit of the Spirit is another really helpful list if you want to check that out at some point. Um, so it's the virtue upon which all the others are built upon. Next, we see virtue or goodness. So as we travel up this ascending staircase, we're called to move from faith in Jesus Christ to goodness or virtue. Virtue is moral excellence. 
In fact, goodness has already been used in this passage to describe God's character. As a follower of Jesus, we are called upon to put on goodness. We're called to have virtue in our lives um, because of what he did. And to goodness, add knowledge. Knowledge is the ability to discern God's will and take the necessary steps to put those God-given knowledge into practice. Um, many people are knowledgeable when it comes to various aspects of the world. They, they might get great grades. They might know a lot about everything, really, or a little bit of everything and a lot about a couple things. But that's not to be confused with knowledge about the Lord. Um, I, at the beginning of our talk this morning, I talked about this being a really confusing point in history where so much knowledge is spilled out to us at any minute time, especially because it's because of social media. We have so much information even at our phones, more information that people have had all through history. And so it's easy to attain knowledge in the head, but to actually know the Lord and know Jesus Christ and know who he is about him is a whole different story. And so it's only when we have that God-given knowledge that we can know what he wants us to do and how to implement that into every part of our life. So it's more than just knowing about God and, and consuming information, but it's all about applying that information to our lives. Next, we see self-control and to knowledge self-control. Um, Peter and the other New Testament writers, because self-control is, we find in other places, understood self-control to empower believers to resist various temptations instead of becoming an active participator with the world. So as Christians, we're not called to escape the world. We're not, we're not called to run away to a cave and never encounter the world. We're called to be in the world amongst people that don't know him so that we can be a shining light in the darkness. However, we are called to have self-control and through the power of the Holy Spirit um, within that time. So there's temptations that come, us, come at us from every angle every single day of our lives, both from outside of us and from within us. And so as a Christian, self-control is vital if we're going to be able to continue to, to grow and live by the Spirit in our lives. And to knowledge, self-control. And next we have steadfastness, or another word, perseverance. Perseverance is a term in the New Testament that used to talk about standing in the midst of trials. So if temptations um, are some of those things that are called to um, bring us to the point of sinning and not trusting God, a trial could include those difficult times in our life that many times don't include sin, but just include tough, tough things that happen in our life that pull our faith of God down. Um, we can, tr during trials, we're um, drained of our strength and drained of emotional energy, and a lot of times we're tempted to not trust in the Lord and during those times. So trials can include um, a long time of sickness. It can include um, divorce in your family. It can include um, someone at losing, losing somebody in your family. It can include moving to a different part of the country and leaving all of your friends that you knew. Um, it includes so many big things like that and little things that you may be encountering this week. Um, I, I presume that all of us have had trials of some level this very week at camp. So along with the other virtues listed so far, um, the, we need God's supernatural ability to help overcome this with perseverance and steadfastness. We need to be able to stand strong in the middle of any trial that, that comes into our life because the trials will come and how we choose to respond to those trials is going to make the difference in our growth. As we continue to travel and to perseverance, we see godliness. So I don't want to read too many definitions, but Strong's Concordance defines godliness as someone's inner response to the things of God would show itself godly and reverent. So as we become, make an effort to put on godliness, we will become more inclined to respond to everyday things the way God would have responded, the way Jesus did when he was on earth. And so how would Jesus respond to these things if he was encountering what we encountered? Um, that is how we would live. And we look through the Bible, we look to the Gospels, Paul's, Paul's letters, to teach us many of those characteristics, godliness. Okay, you still with me on this? We're on number six. Two more left to go. Um, mutual affection or brotherly love. So unto godliness we put on mutual affection. The Greek word used for love in this verse is Philadelphia, meaning love of brother or mutual affection, as in the NIV. Mutual affection is the form of loving your fellow Christians or brothers or sisters. Um, this is probably um, 
one of the easier ones and one of the harder things, harder ones all at the same time. It's easy to love your neighbor when you really like your neighbor and there's someone you get along with and someone you want to be around. Um, but it's a lot more difficult when it's someone that it's just as difficult for you to get along. Not everybody meshes easily. Um, as Christians, we're all called to fellowship together, but we're not all necessarily going to be best friends. Um, but what, it's, it's different. Love is, um, or brotherly love is different here. What do we need to do to have affection and care about and love that person that's next to us, even when it's difficult? We're called to do that, and I think we can do that with the help of each other. I talked a lot about, of course, about the Holy Spirit empowering us to do it, but in, our encouragement from each other can help us to continue to care about each other and love each other. Then the last one is very similar to that, um, mutual affection, and here we have love. Um, the Greek word used in this final verse is the virtue agape, which is a little different than the last word we talked about, which is selfless, sacrificial, and unconditional love that is considered the highest type of love in the New Testament. Um, this is the kind of love that God has for his people, and in this passage we're called to have agape love. So not only are we called to like, have a mutual affection for each other, but we're called to have a sacrificial, all-encompassing love for brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, in his commentary, Douglas Moo said this about love. Love is not only the last and greatest Christian virtue, it is also the glue that holds all of the rest of them together, the quality without which all of the others would be less than they should be. Um, so we are called by the gospel to love each other. It is the glue that holds them all together. Colossians 3.14 says, And above, over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So, I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago, this list is extensive. Whenever we get into these lists in the New Testament, there's a lot of information, and it's all fill, fueled by the gospel. Um, but we really should ex increasingly be growing in godliness in all these areas. Um, but it's important to know that we're not called to figure these things out on our own. These aren't just things that we need to kind of sit in our room and dwell upon. We're given each other to talk about it. You have counselors, you have leaders, we have these chapels in the morning, but you're also given, if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit who wants to guide you towards truth, and he wants to guide you and point to Jesus throughout the scriptures. So as we seek to put these things into, into practice, I encourage you to continue to look within the Bible and God's word to learn these things. God's power provides us with every resource we need for spiritual maturity and effectiveness, and his word is one of those most powerful resources that we have. So my final point here is, is I wrote here, gospel-motivated living, and that's our last verse in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So gospel-motivated living is what we need to not, be, to not be ineffective. We don't want to be ineffective or unfruitful Christians. So verses 3 to 4 gave, us, gave Christians the source of the power. Verses 5 to 7 gave the Christian the assignment or purpose of spiritual maturity. And now in verse 8, we see that possessing the virtues in 5 to 7 will keep the Christian from being ineffective and unproductive. We want to be effective Christians. We were saved to be on mission with God. Um, we were saved to, be escaped, to escape um, the destiny of life apart from, from God in hell. That, that is part of what we did, but we also want to be fruitful believers all through the time he gives us on earth and join together with him in this mission. We don't want to be without fruit. Too many Christians are simply content um, to be happy that they're not going to hell, but the true Christian never rests content with such a minimal level of Christian experience. True knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ should always spark an unquenchable desire to know him better in knowledge and serve him and loving other people. The Christian in these verses is going to produce gospel-motivated Christian fruit for the rest of their lives. It doesn't mean we're not going to have bumpy points along the way, but for the rest of our lives we're called to produce spiritual fruit, and we'll be able to stand in the midst of storms and trials and temptations and continue being productive for the Lord because we know that God provides us with the power that we need to be effective for Him. So with that, I wrote down a couple application points to take with us. And as always, um, I trust that God, through his Holy Spirit, is pointing out specific areas of your life 
but I'm going to list a couple that I wrote down for myself. So as we learned in verse 3, apart from the gospel, you don't even have a chance to escape the corruption of the world. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, my challenge to you is to respond to the invitation of salvation through Jesus in the gospel. We need Jesus. Um, if you've had a period of time where you're kind of drifting off from that relationship with him, I encourage you, you already know him. You can't lose that. So I encourage you to realign your life around the gospel and come back to Jesus and ask him to help you in that area. Um, if you've already accepted salvation through Jesus, um, spent, and, I'm, and this is for everybody else, let's, I encourage you to continue spending time in the word, um, in prayer, and talking to trusted Christian friends to, to identify sometimes what's holding us back. Because all of us in our life, all of us Christians can look at certain areas of our life and see that we're not, we might not be growing in certain areas. Our growth might be stunted. Um, so it really does take looking to his word and asking for help from other friends that you trust to identify things that are holding you back. It might be a sinful pattern in your life. It might be fear. I mean, fear is, a, is something that holds us all back at different points. It could be a lack of trust. So I encourage you to repent and move forward by making every effort to put on these virtues with the Lord's help. And third, commit to a gospel-motivated life that produces much spiritual fruit. And there's so much joy in this. Commit to a gospel-motivated life. Invest in the discipleship process of becoming more like Jesus. Spend time in the Word. Find a mentor. Commit to the local church. Be effective. Grow in godliness all through God's power. He wants to do that to us and through us, and he wants to help us to be effective Christians. Um, and I, I hope that's something that, you can, that you're doing right now, and if you're struggling right now, I encourage you to talk to me, your counselor, um, or anybody that you encounter today. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, um, this morning we, um, we come to you humbled to see that what you've entrusted us with, Lord. Thank you that you've given us the gospel. Thank you that you love us. Um, I just pray right now that we could be effective believers that are fruitful in so many areas of our life so that we can make a difference for you, Lord. So we can show people the goodness of your love um, and who you are, Lord, through our lives. I pray for um, any of us right now who are struggling um, to live effective lives. And we might call ourselves believers, but we're struggling to live for you, Lord. Um, give us the power to um, come to you in, um, and confess our sins to you and repent and just turn around and come back to you, Lord. I just pray for anyone who is struggling right now, give them the power and courage they need to make those changes in their life, Lord. Just be with us today um, through the busy day and the busyness of it all, and to keep you, this, keep you in the center of it all throughout. In your name, amen.